The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis Chapter 1 Men Without Chests I doubt whether we are sufficiently attentive to the importance of elementary textbooks. That is why I have chosen as the starting point for these lectures a little book on English intended for boys and girls in the upper forms of schools. I do not think the authors of this book, there were two of them, intended any harm, and I owe them or their publisher good language for sending me a complimentary copy. At the same time, I shall have nothing good to say of them. Here is a pretty predicament. I do not want to pillory two modest practicing schoolmasters who were doing their best that they knew, but I cannot be silent about what I think the actual tendency of their book. I therefore propose to conceal their names. I shall refer to these gentlemen as Gaius and Titius, and to their work, The Green Book. But I promise you there is such a book, and I have it on my shelves. In their second chapter, they quote the well-known story of Coleridge at the waterfall. You remember that there were two tourists present. The one called it sublime, and the other pretty, and that Coleridge mentally endorsed the first judgment and rejected the second with disgust. Gaius and Titius comment as follows. When the man said, this is sublime, he appeared to be making a remark about the waterfall. Actually, he was not making a remark about the waterfall, but a remark about his own feelings. What he was saying was really, I have feelings associated in my mind with the word sublime, or shortly, I have sublime feelings. Here are a good many deep questions settled in a pretty summary fashion. But the authors are not yet finished. They add, this confusion is continually present in the language as we use it. We appear to be saying something very important about something, and actually, we are only saying something about our own feelings. Before considering the issue really raised by the momentous little paragraph, designed, you will remember, for the upper forms of schools, we must eliminate one mere confusion into which Gaius and Titius have fallen. Even on their own view, on any conceivable view, the man who says this is sublime cannot mean I have sublime feelings. Even if it were granted that such qualities as sublimity were simply and solely projected into things from our own emotions, yet the emotions which prompt the projection are the correlatives, and therefore almost the opposites of the qualities projected. The feelings which make a man call an object sublime are not sublime feelings, but feelings of veneration. If this is sublime is to be reduced at all to a statement about the speaker's feelings, the proper translation would be, I have humble feelings. If the view held by Gaius and Titius were consistently applied, it would lead to obvious absurdities. It would force them to maintain that you are contemptible means I have contemptible feelings. In fact, that your feelings are contemptible means my feelings are contemptible. But we need not delay over this subject. It would be unjust to Gaius and Titius themselves to emphasize what was doubtless a mere inadvertence. The schoolboy who reads this passage in the Green Book will believe two propositions. Firstly, that all sentences containing a predictive of value are statements about the emotional state of the speaker, and secondly, that all such statements are unimportant. It is true that Gaius and Titius have said neither of these things in so many words. They have treated only one particular predicament of value, sublime, as a word descriptive of the speaker's emotions. The pupils are left to do for themselves the work of extending the same treatment to all predictives of value. And no slightest obstacle to such extension is placed in their way. The authors may or may not desire the extension. They may never have given the question five minutes of serious thoughts in their lives. I am not concerned with what they desire, but with the effect of their book will certainly have on the schoolboy's mind. In the same way, they have not said that judgments of value are unimportant. Their words are that we appear to be saying something very important, when in reality we are only saying something about our own feelings. No schoolboy will be able to resist the suggestion brought to bear upon him by the word only. I do not mean, of course, that he will make any conscious inference from what he reads to a general philosophical theory that all values are subjective and trivial. The very power of Gaius and Titius depends on the fact that they are dealing with a boy, a boy who thinks he is doing his English prep and has no notions that ethics, theology, and politics are all at stake. 
It is not a theory they put into his mind, but an assumption which ten years hence, its origin forgotten and its presence unconscious, will condition him to take one side in a controversy which he has never recognized as a controversy at all. The authors themselves, I suspect, hardly know what they are doing to the boy, and he cannot know what is being done to him. Before considering the philosophical credentials of the position which Gaius and Titius have adopted about value, I should like to show its practical results on an educational procedure. In their fourth chapter, they quote a silly advertisement of pleasure crews and proceed to inoculate their pupils against that sort of writing it exhibits. The advertisement tells us that those who buy tickets for this cruise will go across the western ocean where Drake of Devon sailed, adventuring after the treasure of the Indies, and bringing home themselves also a treasure of golden hours and glowing colors. It is a bad bit of writing, of course, a venial and pathetic exploitation of those emotions of awe and pleasure which men feel in visiting places that have striking associations with histories or legends. If Gaius and Titius were to stick to their last and teach their readers, as they promised to do, the art of English composition, it was their business to put this advertisement side by side with the passage from great writers in which the very emotion is well expressed, and then show where the difference lies. They might have used Johnson's famous passage from the Western Islands, which concludes that man is little to be envied, whose patriotism would not gain force upon the plain of Marathon or whose piety would not grow warmer among the ruins of Iona. They might have taken the place in the prelude, where Wordsworth describes how the antiquity of London first descended on his mind with weight and power, power growing under weight, a lesson which had laid such literature besides the advertisements and really discriminated the good from the bad would have been a lesson worth teaching. There would have been some blood and sap in it, the trees of knowledge and of life growing together. It would also have had the merit of being a lesson in literature, a subject of which Gaius and Titius, despite their professed purpose, are uncommonly shy. What they actually do is to point out that the luxurious motor vessel won't really sail where Drake did, that the tourists will not have any adventures, that the treasure they are bringing home will be of purely metaphorical nature, and that the trip to Marigate might provide all the pleasures and rest they required. All this is very true. Talents inferior to those of Gaius and Titius would have sufficed to discover it. What they have not noticed or not cared about is that a very similar treatment could be applied to much good literature which treats the same emotion. What, after all, can the history of early British Christianity and pure reason add to the motives for piety in the existence of the 18th century? Why should Mr. Wordsworth Inn be more comfortable or in the air of London more healthy because London has existed for a long time? Or, if there is indeed any obstacle which will prevent a critic from debunking Johnson and Wordsworth and Lamb and Virgil and Thompson Brown and Mr. De La Marie, as the Green Book debunks the advertisements, Gaius and Titius have given their schoolboy readers no faintest help to discover it. From this passage, the schoolboy will learn about literature precisely nothing. What he will learn quickly enough, and perhaps indelibly, is the belief that all emotions aroused by local association are in themselves contrary to reason and contemptible. He will have no notion that there are two ways of being immune to such an advertisement, that it falls equally flat on those who are above it and those who are below it, on the man of real sensibility and on the mere trousered ape who has never been able to conceive the Atlantic as anything more than so many million tons of cold salt water. There are two men to whom we offer in vain a false leading article on patriotism and honor. One is the coward, the other is the honorable and patriotic man. None of this is brought before the schoolboy's mind. On the contrary, he is encouraged to reject the lure of the western ocean on the very dangerous ground that in so doing he will prove himself a knowing fellow who cannot be bubbled out of his cash. Gaius and Titius, while teaching him nothing about letters, have cut out his soul, long before he is old enough to choose the possibility of having certain experiences which thinkers of more authority than they have held to be generous, fruitful, and humane. But it is not only Gaius and Titius. In another little book, whose author I will call Orbilius, I find that the same operation under the same general anesthetic is being carried out. Orbilius, choosing for debunking a silly bit of writing on horses, 
where these animals are praised as the willing servants of the early colonists in Australia, and he falls into the same trap as Gaius and Titius, of Ruksh and the weeping horses of Achilles and the war horses in the book of Job, nay, even Br'er Rabbit and Peter Rabbit, of man's prehistoric piety to our brother the ox, of all that this semi-anthropomorphic treatment of the beasts has meant in human history, and of the literature where it finds noble or piquant expression. He has not a word to say. Even of the problems of animal psychology, as they exist for science, he says nothing. He contends himself with explaining that horses are not interested in colonial expansion. This piece of information is really all that his pupils get from him. Why the composition before them is bad, when others that lie open to the same charges are good, they do not hear. Much less do they learn of the two classes of men who are respectively above and below the danger of such writing. The man who really knows horses and really loves them, not with anthropomorphic illusions, but with ordinate love, and the irredeemable urban blockhead to whom a horse is merely an old-fashioned means of transport, some pleasure in their own ponies and dogs they will have lost, some incentive to cruelty or neglect they will have received, some pleasure in their own knowingness will have entered their minds. That is their day's lesson in English, though of English they have learned nothing. Another little portion of human heritage has been quietly taken from them before they were old enough to understand. I have hitherto been assuming that such teachers as Gaius and Titius do not fully realize what they are doing and do not intend the far-reaching consequences it will actually have. There is, of course, another possibility. What I have called, presuming on their concurrence and in certain traditional systems of value, the trousered ape and the urban blockhead may be precisely the kind of man that they really wish to produce. The difference between us may go all the way down. They may really hold that the ordinary human feelings about the past, or animals, or large waterfalls, are contrary to reason and contemptible and ought to be eradicated. They may be intending to make a clean sweep of traditional values and start with a new set. That position will be discussed later. If it is the position which Gaius and Titius are holding, I must, for the moment, contend myself with pointing out that it is a philosophical and not literary position. In filling their books with it, they have been unjust to the parent or headmaster who buys it and who has got the work of amateur philosophers where he expected the work of professional grammarians. A man would be annoyed if his son returned from the dentist with his teeth untouched and his head crammed with the dentist's obert dicta on the Metellian or the Baconian theory. But I doubt whether Gaius and Titius have really planned, under cover of teaching English, to propagate their philosophy. I think they have slipped into it for the following reasons. In the first place, literary criticism is difficult, and what they actually do is very much easier. To explain why a bad treatment of some basic human emotion is bad literature is, if excluded all question-begging attacks on the emotion itself, a very hard thing to do. Even Dr. Richards, who first seriously tackled the problem of badness in literature, failed, I think, to do it. To debunk the emotion on the basis of commonplace rationalism is within almost anyone's capacity. In the second place, I think Gaius and Titius may have honestly misunderstood the pressing educational need of the moment. They see the world around them swayed by emotional propaganda. They have learned from tradition that youth is sentimental, and that they concluded that the best thing they can do is to fortify the minds of young people against emotion. My own experience as a teacher tells an opposite tale. For every one pupil who needs to be guarded from a weak excess of sensibility, there are three who need to be awakened from the slumber of cold vulgarity. The task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. The right defense against false sentiments is to inoculate just sentiments. By starving the sensibility of the pupils, we only make them easier prey to the propagandist when he comes. For famished nature will be avenged, and a hard heart is no infallible protection against the soft head. But there is a third and a profounder reason for the procedure which Gaius and Titius adopt. They may be perfectly ready to admit that a good education should build some sentiments while destroying others. They may endeavor to do so, but it is impossible that they should succeed. Do what they will, it is the debunking side of their work, and this side alone, which will really tell. In order to grasp this necessity, clearly I must digress for a moment to show that what may be called the educational predicament of Gaius and Titius is different from all their predecessors. 
Until quite modern times, all teachers and even all men believed the universe to be such that certain emotional reactions on our part could be either congruous or incongruous to it. Believed in fact that objects did not merely receive, but could merit our approval or disapproval, our reverence or our contempt, the reason why Coleridge agreed with the tourist who called the cataract sublime and disagreed with the one who called it pretty, was of course that he believed inanimate nature to be such that certain responses could be more just or ordinate or appropriate to it than others. And he believed, correctly, that the tourists thought the same. The man who called the cataract sublime was not intending simply to describe his own emotions about it. He was also claiming that the object was one which merited those emotions. But for this claim, there would be nothing to agree or disagree about. To disagree with, this is pretty, if those words simply describe the lady's feelings, would be absurd. If she had said, I feel sick, Coleridge would hardly have replied, no, I feel quite well. When Shelley, having compared the human sensibility to an Aeolian liar, goes on to admit that it differs from a liar in having a power of internal adjustment, whereby it can accommodate its cords to the motion of that which strikes them, he is assuming the same belief. Can you be righteous unless you be just in rendering to things their due esteem? All things were made to be yours, and you were made to prize them according to their value. St. Augustine defines virtue as ordo amoris the ordinate condition of the affection in which every object is accorded that kind of degree of love which is appropriate to it. Aristotle says that the aim of education is to make the pupil like and dislike what he ought. When the age for reflective thought comes, the pupil who has been thus trained in ordinate affections or just sentiments will easily find the first principle in ethics. But to corrupt man, they will never be visible at all, and he can make no progress in that science. Plato, before him, had said the same. The little human animal will not at first have the right response. It must be trained to feel pleasure, liking, disgust, and hatred at those things which really are pleasant, likable, disgusting, and hateful. In the Republic, the well-nurtured youth is one who would see most clearly whatever was amiss in an ill-made world of man or ill-grown works of nature, and with a just distaste would blame and hate the ugly even from his earliest years and would give delighted praise to beauty, receiving it into his soul and being nourished by it, so that he became a man of gentle heart. All this before he is of age to reason, so that when reason at length comes to him, then, bred as he has been, he will hold out his hand in welcome and recognize her because of the affinity he bears to her. In early Hinduism, that conduct in men which can be called good consists in conformity to, or almost participation in, the rita, that great ritual or pattern of nature and supernature which is revealed alike in the cosmic order, the moral virtues, and the ceremonial of the temple. Righteousness, correctness, order, the rita, is constantly identified with truth, correspondence to reality. As Plato said that the good was beyond existence, and Wordsworth that though virtue the stars were strong, so the Indian masters say that the gods themselves are born of the rita and obey it. The Chinese also speak of great things, the greatest thing, called the Tao. It is the reality beyond all predicates, the abyss that was before the creator himself. It is nature, it is the way, the road, it is the way in which the universe goes on, the way in which things everlastingly emerge, stilly and tranquilly, into space and time. It is also the way which every man should tread in imitation of that cosmic and supercosmic progression, conforming all activities to that greater exemplar. In ritual, say the Analects, it is harmony with nature that is prized. The ancient Jews, likewise, praised the law as being true. This conception, in all its forms, Platonic, Aristotelian, Stoic, Christian, and Oriental alike, I shall henceforth refer to for brevity simply as the Tao. Some of the accounts of which I have quoted will seem perhaps to many of you merely quaint or even magical, but what is common to them all is something we cannot neglect. It is the doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain attitudes are really true and others are really false to the kind of thing the universe is and the kind of things we are. Those who know the Tao can hold that to call children delightful or old men venerable is not simply to record a psychological fact about our own parental and filial emotions at the moment, 
but to recognize a quality which demands a certain response from us whether we make it or not. I myself do not enjoy the society of small children because I speak from within the Tao. I recognize this as a defect in myself, just as a man may have to recognize that he is tone deaf or colorblind. And because our approvals and disapprovals are thus recognitions of objective value and responses to objective order, therefore emotional states can be in harmony with reason, when we feel liking for what ought to be approved, or out of harmony with reason, when we perceive that liking is due but cannot feel it. No emotion is, in itself, a judgment. In that sense, all emotions and sentiments are illogical. But they can be reasonable or unreasonable, as they conform to reason or fail to conform. The heart never takes the place of the head, but it can and should obey it. Over against this stands the world of the Green Book. In it, the very possibility of a sentiment being reasonable, or even unreasonable, has been excluded from the outset. It can be reasonable or unreasonable only if it conforms or fails to conform to something else. To say that the cataract is sublime means saying that our emotions of humility is appropriate or ordinate to the reality. And thus, to speak of something else besides the emotion, just as to say that a shoe fits is to speak not only of shoes, but of feet. But this reference to something beyond the emotion is what Gaius and Titius exclude from every sentence containing a predicate of value. Such statements, for them, refer solely to the emotion. Now the emotion, thus considered by itself, cannot be either in agreement or disagreement with reason. It is irrational, not as a paralogism, is irrational, but as a physical event is irrational. It does not rise even to the dignity of error. On this view, the world of facts, without one trace of value, and the world of feelings, without one trace of truth or falsehood, justice or injustice, confront one another and no reproachment is possible. Hence, the educational problem is wholly different according as who you stand within or without the Tao. For those within, the task is to train in the pupil those responses which are in themselves appropriate, whether anyone is making them or not. And in making, which the very nature of man consists, those without, if they are logical, must regard all sentiments as equally non-rational, as mere mists between us and the real objects. As a result, they must either decide to remove all sentiments as far as possible from the pupil's minds, or else to encourage some sentiments for reason that have nothing to do with their intrinsic justiceness or ordinancy. The latter course involves them in the questionable process of creating in others by suggestion or incantation a mirage which their own reason has successfully dissipated. Perhaps this will become clearer if we take a concrete instance. When a Roman father told his son that it was a sweet and seemingly thing to die for his country, he believed what he said. He was communicating to the son an emotion which he himself shared and which he believed to be in accord with the value which his judgment discerned in a noble death. He was giving the boy the best he had, giving of his spirit to humanizing him as he had given of his body to beget him. But Gaius and Titius cannot believe that in calling such a death sweet and seemly, they would be saying something important about something. Their own method of debunking would cry out against them if they attempted to do so. For death is not something to eat and therefore cannot be dulce in the literal sense, and it is unlikely that the real sensation preceding it will be dulce even by analogy. And as for decorum, that is, only a word describing how some other people will feel about your death when they happen to think of it, which won't be often and will certainly do you no good. There are only two courses open to Gaius and Titius. Either they must go the whole way and debunk this sentiment like any other, or they must set themselves to work the produce, from outside a sentiment which they believe to be of no value to the pupil, and which may cost him his life, because it is useful to us, the survivors, that our young men should feel it. If they embark on this course, the difference between the old and the new education will be an important one. Where the old initiated the new merely conditions, the old dealt with the pupils as grown birds deal with young birds when they teach them to fly. The new deals with them more as the poultry keeper deals with young birds, making them thus or thus for purpose of which the birds know nothing. In a word, the old was a kind of propagation, men transmitting manhood to men. The new is merely propaganda. It is to their credit that Gaius and Titius embraced the first alternative. 
Propaganda is their abomination, not because their own philosophy gives a ground for condemning it, or anything else, but because they are better than their principles. They probably have some vague notion, I will examine it in my next lecture, that valor and good faith and justice could be sufficiently commended to the pupil on what they would call rational or biological or modern grounds, if it should ever become necessary. In the meantime, they leave the matter alone and get on with the busyness of debunking. But this course, though less inhuman, is not less disastrous than the opposite alternative of cynical propaganda. Let us suppose for a moment that the harder virtues could really be theoretically justified with no appeal to objective value. It still remains true that no justification of virtue will enable a man to be virtuous. Without the aid of trained emotion, the intellect is powerless against the animal organism. I had sooner play cards against a man who was quite skeptical about ethics, but bred to believe that a gentleman does not cheat than against an irreproachable moral philosopher who had been brought up among sharpers. In battle, it is not syllogism that will keep the reluctant nerves and muscles to their post in the third hour of the bombardment. The crudest sentimentalism, such as Gaius and Titus would wince at, about a flag or a country or a regiment will be of more use. We were told it all long ago by Plato. As the king governs by his executive, so reason in man must rule the mere appetites by means of the spiritual element. The head rules the belly through the chest. The seat, as Alanus tells us, of magnanimity, of emotions organized by trained habit into stable sentiments. The chest, magnanimity, sentiment, these are the indispensable liaisons of officers between cerebral man and visceral man. It may even be said that it is by this middle element that man is man, for by intellect he is mere spirit and by appetite he is mere animal. The operation of the Green Book and its kind is to produce what we may be called men without chests. It is an outrage that they should be commonly spoken of as intellectuals. This gives them a chance to say that he who attacks them attacks intelligence. It is not so. They are not distinguished from other men by any unusual skill in finding truth, nor any virginal ardor to pursue her. Indeed, it would be strange if they were a persevering devotion to truth. A nice sense of intellectual honor cannot be long maintained without the aid of sentiment which Gaius and Titius could debunk as easily as any other. It is not the excess of thought, but defect of fertile and generous emotion that marks them out. Their heads are no bigger than the ordinary. It is the atrophy of the chest beneath that makes them seem so. And all the time, such is the tragic comedy of the situation. We continue to clamor for those very qualities we are rendering impossible. You can hardly open a periodical without coming across the statement that what our civilization needs is more drive, or dynamism, or self-sacrifice, or creativity. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our mists. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. Chapter 2. The Way The practical result of education in the spirit of the Green Book must be the destruction of society which accepts it. But this is not necessarily a refutation of subjectivism about values as a theory. The true doctrine might be a doctrine which if we accept, we die. No one who speaks from within the Tao could reject it on that account. But it has not yet come to that. There are theoretical difficulties in the philosophy of Gaius and Titius. However subjective they may be about some traditional values, Gaius and Titius have shown by the very act of writing the Green Book that there must be some other values about which they are not subjective at all. They write in order to produce certain states of mind in the rising generation, if not because they think those states of mind intrinsically just or good, yet certainly because they think them to be the means of some state of society which they regard as desirable. It would not be difficult to collect from the various passages in the Green Book what their ideal is, but we need not. The important point is not the precise nature of their end, but the fact that they have an end at all. They must have or their book, being purely practical in intention, is written to no purpose, and this end must have a real value in their eyes. To abstain from calling it good, and to use, instead, such predicates as necessary, or progressive, or efficient, would be a subterfuge. 
they could be forced by argument to answer the questions of necessary for what, progressive towards what, affecting what. In the last resort, they would have to admit that some state of affairs was, in their opinion, good for its own sake. And this time, they could not maintain that good simply described their own emotion about it. For the whole purpose of the book is so to condition the young reader that he will share their approval, and this would be either a fool's or a villain's undertaking unless they held that their approval was in some way valid or correct. In actual fact, Gaius and Titius will be found to hold, with complete uncritical dogmaticism, the whole system of values which happened to be in vogue among moderately educated men of the professional classes during the period between the two wars. Their skepticism about values is on the surface. It is for use on other people's values. About the values current in their own set, they are not nearly skeptical enough. And this phenomenon is very usual. A great many of those who debunk traditional, or, as they would say, sentimental values, have in the background values of their own which they believe to be immune from the debunking process. They claim to be cutting away the parasitic growth of emotion, religious sanction, and inherited taboos, in order that real or basic values may emerge. I will now try to find out what happens if this is seriously attempted. Let us continue to use the previous example, that of death for a good cause. Not of course because virtue is the only value of martyrdom, the only virtue, but because this is the experimentum crucis, which shows different systems of the thought in the clearest light. Let us suppose that an innovator in values regards dulce et decorum, and greater love hath no man as mere irrational sentiments, which are to be stripped off in order that we may get down to the realistic or basic ground of this value. Where will he find such a ground? First of all, he might say that the real value lay in the utility of such sacrifice to the community. Good, he might say, means what is useful to the community. But of course, the death of the community is not useful to the community, only the death of some of its members. What is really meant is that the death of some men is useful to other men. That is very true. But on what ground are some men being asked to die for the benefit of others? Every appeal to pride, honor, shame, or love is excluded by hypothesis. To use these would be to return to the sentiment and the innovator's task is. Having cut all that away, to explain to men in terms of pure reasoning why they will be well advised to die that others may live. He may say, unless some of us risk death, all of us are certain to die. But that will be true only in a limited number of cases, and even when it is true it provokes the very reasonable counter question, why should I be the one of those who takes that risk? At this point, the innovator may ask, why after all? Selfishness should be more rational or intelligent than altruism. The question is welcome. If by reason we mean that the process actually employed by Gaius and Titius when engaged in debunking, that is, the connecting by inference of propositional ultimately derived from a sense data with further propositions, when the answer must be that a refusal to sacrifice oneself is no more rational than the consent to do so, and no less rational. Neither choice is rational or irrational at all. From propositions about fact alone, no practical conclusion can ever be drawn. This will preserve society, cannot lead to do this except by the mediation of society ought to be preserved. This will cost you your life, cannot lead directly to do not do this. It cannot lead to it only through a felt desire or an acknowledgement duty of self-preservation. The innovator is trying to get a conclusion in the imperative mood out of premises that are in the indicative mood, and though he continues trying to all eternity, he cannot succeed, for the thing is impossible. We must therefore either extend the word reason to include what our ancestors called practical reason and confess that judgment, such as society ought to be preserved, though they cannot support themselves by no reason of the sort that Gaius and Titius demand, are not mere sentiments but are rationality itself. Or else, we must give up at once and forever the attempt to find a core of rational value behind all sentiments we must have debunked. The innovator will not take the first alternative, for practical principle known to all men by reason are simply the Tao, which he has set out to supersede. He is more likely to give up the quest for rational core and to hunt for some other ground even more basic and realistic. 
This he will probably feel that he has found in instinct. The preservation of society and of the species itself are ends that do not hang on the precarious thread of reason. They are given by instinct. That is why there is no need to argue against the man who does not acknowledge them. We have an instinctive urge to preserve our own species. That is why men ought to work for posterity. We have no instinctive urge to keep promises or to respect individual life. That is why scruples of justice and humanity, in fact, the Tao, can be properly swept away when they conflict with our real end, the preservation of the species. That again is why the modern situation permits and demands a new sexual morality. The old taboos served some real purpose in helping to preserve the species, but contraceptives have modified this and we can now abandon many of the taboos. For of course, sexual desire, being instinctive, is to be gratified whenever it does not conflict with the preservation of the species. It looks, in fact, as if the ethics based on the instinctive will give the innovator all he wants and nothing that he does not want. In reality, we have not advanced one step. I will not insist on the point that instinct is a name for we know not what. To say that migratory birds find their way by instinct is only to say that we do not know how migratory birds find their way. For I think it is here being used in a fairly definitive sense to mean an unreflective or spontaneous impulse widely felt by the members of a given species. In what way does instinct, thus conceived, help to find real values? It is maintained that we must obey instinct, that we cannot do otherwise. But if so, why are green books and the like written? Why this stream of exhortation to drive us where we cannot help going? Why such praise for those who have submitted to the inevitable? Or is it maintained that if we do obey instinct, we shall be happy and satisfied? But the very question we are considering was that of facing death, which, so far as the innovator knows, cuts off every possible satisfaction. And if we have the instinctive desire for the good of posterity, then this desire, by the very nature of the case, can never be satisfied, since, it aims at a, since its aim is achieved, if at all, when we are dead. It looks very much as if the innovator would have to say not that we must obey instinct, nor that it will satisfy us to do so, but that we ought to obey it. But why ought we to obey instinct? Is there another instinct of a higher order directing us to do so? And a third of still higher order directing us to obey it? An infinite regress of instincts? This is presumably impossible, but nothing else will serve. From the statement about psychological fact, I have an impulse to do so and so. We cannot by any ingenuity derive the practical principle. I ought to obey this impulse. Even if it were true that men had a spontaneous, unreflective impulse to sacrifice their own lives for the preservation of their fellows, it remains a quite separate question whether this is an impulse they should control or one they should indulge. For even the innovator admits that many impulses, those which conflict with the preservation of the species, have to be controlled. And this admission surely introduces us yet a more fundamentally difficult problem. Telling us to obey instinct is like telling us to obey people. People say different things, so do instincts. Our instincts are at war. If it is held that the instincts for preserving the species should always be obeyed at the expense of other instincts, whence do we derive this rule of precedent? To listen to the instinct speaking in its own cause and deciding in its own favor would be rather simple-minded. Each instinct, if you listen to it, will claim to be gratified at the expense of all the rest. By the very act of listening to one rather than the others, we have already prejudged the case. If we did not bring to the examination of our instincts a knowledge of their comparative dignity, we could never learn from them. And that knowledge cannot itself be instinctive. The judge cannot be one of the parties judged. Or, if he is, the decision is worthless, and there is no ground for placing the preservation of the species above the preservation of sexual appetite. The idea that, without appealing to any court higher than the instincts themselves, we can yet find grounds for preferring one instinct above its fellows dies very hard. We grasp at useless words. We call it the basics, or fundamental, or primal, or deepest instinct. It is of no avail. Either these words conceal a value judgment passed upon the instinct and therefore not derivable from it, or else they merely record its felt intensity, the frequency of its operation, and its wide distribution. If the former, the whole attempt to base value upon instinct, has been abandoned, 
If the latter, these observations about the quantitative aspects of psychological event lead to no practical conclusion. It is the old dilemma. Either the premises already concealed an imperative, or the conclusion remains merely in the indicative. Finally, it is worth inquiry whether there is an instinct to care for posterity or preserve the species. I do not discover it in myself, and yet I am a man rather prone to think of remote futurity. A man who can read Mr. Olaf Stapledon with delight. Much less do I find it easy to believe that the majority of people who have sat opposite me in buses or stood with me in queues feel an unreflective impulse to do anything at all about the species or posterity. Only people educated in a particular way have ever had the idea posterity before their minds at all. It is difficult to assign to instinct our attitudes towards an object which exists only for the reflective men. What we have by nature is an impulse to preserve our own children and grandchildren, an impulse which grows progressively feebler as the imagination looks forward and finally dies out in the desert of vast futurity. No parents who were guided by this instinct would dream for a moment of setting up the claims of their hypothetical descendants against those of the baby actually crowing and kicking in the room. Those of us who accept the Tao may perhaps say that they ought to do so. But that is not open to those who treat instinct as the source of value. As we pass from mother love to rational planning for the future, we are passing away from the realm of instinct into that of choice and reflection. And if the instinct is the source of value, planning for the future ought to be less respectable and less obligatory than the baby language and cuddling of the fondest mother or the most fatuous nursery anecdotes of a doting father. If we are to base ourselves upon instinct, these things are the substance and care for posterity, the shadow, the huge flickering shadow of nursery happiness cast upon the screen of the unknown future. I do not say this projection is a bad thing, but then I do not believe that instinct is the ground of value judgments. What is absurd is the claim that your care for posterity finds its justification in instinct and then flout at every turn the only instinct on which it could be supposed to rest, tearing the child almost from the breast to crochet and kindergarten in the interest of progress of the coming race. The truth finally becomes apparent that neither in any operation with factual propositions nor in any appeal to instinct can the innovator find the basis for a system of values. None of the principles he requires are to be found there, but they are all to be found somewhere else. All within the four seas are his brothers, says Confucius, of the gentleman, the stoic. Do as you would be done, says Jesus. Humanity is to be preserved, says Locke. All the practical principles behind the innovator's case for posterity or society or the species are there for a time memorial in the Tao, but they are nowhere else. Unless you accept these without question as being to the world of action what axioms are to the world of theory, you can have no practical principles whatsoever. You cannot reach them as conclusions. They are premises. You may, since they can give no reason for themselves as a kind to silence Gaius and Titius, regard them as sentiments, but then you must give up contrasting real or rational value with sentimental value. All value will be sentimental, and you must confess, on pain of abandoning every value, that all sentiment is not merely subjective. You may, on the other hand, regard them as rational, nay, as rationality itself, as things so obviously reasonable that they neither demand nor admit proof. But then you must allow that reason can be practical, that an ought must not be dismissed because it cannot produce some of its credential. If nothing is self-evident, nothing can be proved. Similarly, if nothing is obligatory for its own sake, nothing is obligatory at all. To some, it will appear that I have merely restored under another name what they always meant by basic or fundamental instinct. But much more than a choice of words is involved. The innovator attacks traditional values, the Tao, in defense of what he at first supposes to be, in some special sense, rationale, or biological values. But as we have seen, all the values which he uses in attacking the Tao, and even claims to be substituting for it, are themselves derived from the Tao. If he had really started from scratch, from right outside the human tradition of value, no jugglery could have advanced him an inch towards the conception that man should die for his community or work for posterity. If the Tao falls, all his own conceptions of value fall with it. Not one of them can claim any authority other than that of the Tao. 
only by such shreds of the Tao as he has inherited, as he enabled even to attack it. The question therefore arises that the title he has to select bits of it for acceptance and to reject others. For if the bits he rejects have no authority, neither have those that he retains. If what he retains is valid, what he rejects is equally valid too. The innovator, for example, rates high the claims of posterity. He cannot get any valid claim from posterity out of the instinct, or in the modern sense, reason. He is really deriving our duty to posterity from the Tao. Our duty to do good to all men is an axiom of practical reason. Our duty to do good to our descendants is a clear deduction from it. But then, in every form of the Tao which has come down to us, side by side with the duty to children and descendants lies the duty of parents and ancestors. By what right do we reject one and accept the other? Again, the innovator may place economical value first. To get people fed and clothed is the great end, and in pursuit of the scruples about justice and good, faith may be set aside. The Tao, of course, agrees with him about the importance of getting the people fed and clothed. Unless the innovator were himself using the Tao, he could never have learned of such a duty. But side by side with it in the Tao lie those duties of justice and good faith, which he is ready to debunk. What is his warrant? He may be a racialist, an extreme nationalist, who maintains that the advancement of his own people is the object to which all else ought to yield. But no kind of factual observation and no appeal to instinct will give him a ground for this option. Once more, he is in fact deriving it from the Tao. A duty to our own kin, because they are our own kin. It is part of a traditional morality. But side by side with it in the Tao, and limiting it, lie the inflexible demands of justice. And the rule that, in the long run, all men are our brothers. Whence comes the innovator's authority to pick and choose? Since I can see no answer to these questions, I draw the following conclusions. This thing, which I have called for convenience the Tao, and which others may call natural law or traditional morality, or the first principle of practical reason, or the first platitudes, is not one among a series of possible systems of value. It is the sole source of all value judgments. If it is rejected, all the value is rejected. If any value is retained, it is retained. The effort to refute it and to raise a new system of value in the place of the self-contradictory, there has never been and never will be a radically new judgment of value in the history of the world. What purport the new system, or, as they now call them, ideologies, all consist of fragments from the Tao itself, arbitrarily wrenched from the context in the whole and then swollen to madness in their isolation, yet still owing to the Tao and to it alone such validity as they possess. If my duty to my parent is a superstition, then so is my duty to posterity. If justice is a superstition, then so is my duty to my country or my race. If the pursuit of scientific knowledge is a real value, then so is conjugal fidelity. The rebellion of new ideologies against the Tao is a rebellion of the branches against the tree. If the rebels could succeed, they would find that they had destroyed themselves. The human mind has no more power of inventing a new value than of imagining a new primary color, or indeed of creating a new sun or a new sky from it to move in. Does this mean then that no progress in our perceptions of value can ever take place? That we are bound down forever to an unchanging code given once for all? And is it in any event possible to talk of obeying what I call the Tao? If we lump together as I have done the traditional moralities of East and West, the Christian, the pagan, and the Jew, shall we not find many contradictions and some absurdities? I admit all this. Some criticism, some removal of contradictions, even some real development is required. But there are two very different kinds of criticism. A theorist about language may approach his native tongue as it were from outside regarding its genius as thing that has no claim on him and advocating wholesale alterations of its idiom and spelling in the interest of commercial convenience or scientific accuracy. That is one thing. A great poet who has loved and been well nurtured in his mother's tongue may also make great alterations in it, but his changes of the language are made in the spirit of the language itself. He works from within. The language which suffers has also inspired the changes. That is a different thing, as different as the works of Shakespeare are from basic English. It is the difference between alteration from within and alteration from without. 
between the organic and the surgical. In the same way, the Tao admits development from within. There is a difference between a real moral advance and a mere innovation. From the Confucian, do not do to others what you would not like them to do to you. To the Christian, do as you would be done by, is a real advance. The morality of Nietzsche is a mere innovation. The first is an advance because no one who did not admit the validity of the old maxim could see reason for accepting the new one, and anyone who accepted the old would at once recognize the new as an extension of the same principle. If he rejected it, he would have to reject it as superfluity, something that went too far, not as something simply heterogeneous from his own ideas of value. But the Nietzschean ethic can be accepted only if we are ready to scrap traditional morals as the mere error and then put ourselves in a position where we can find no ground for any value, judgments at all. It is the difference between a man who says to us, you like your vegetables moderately fresh, why not grow your own and have them perfectly fresh? And a man who says, throw away the loaf and try eating bricks and centipedes instead. Those who understand the spirit of the Tao and who have been led by the spirit can modify it in directions which the spirit itself demands. Only they can know what those directions are. The outsider knows nothing about the matter. His attempts at alteration, as we have seen, contradict themselves. So far from being able to harmonize discrepancies in its letters by penetration to its spirit, he merely snatches out some one precept on which the accidents of time and place happen to have riveted his attention, and then rides it to death, for no reason that he can give. From within, the Tao itself comes the only authority to modify the Tao. This is what Confucius meant when he said, With those who follow a different way, it is useless to take counsel. This is why Aristotle said that only those who have been well brought up can usefully study ethics, to the corrupted man, the man who stands outside the Tao, the very starting point of this science is invisible. He may be hostile, but he cannot be critical. He does not know what is being discussed. This is why it was also said, This people that knoweth not the law is accursed, and he that belief shall not be damned. An open mind in question that are not ultimate is useful, but an open mind about the ultimate foundations, either of theoretical or practical reason, is idiocy. If a man's mind is open on these things, let his mouth at least be shut. He can say nothing to the purpose. Outside the Tao, there is no ground for criticizing either the Tao or anything else. In particular instances, it may, no doubt, be a matter of some delicacy to decide where the legitimate internal criticism ends and the fatal external kind begins. But wherever any precept of traditional morality is simply challenged to produce its credentials as though the burden of proof lay on it, we have taken the wrong position. The legitimate reformer endeavors to show that the precept in question conflicts with some precept which is defenders allow to be more fundamental, or that it does not really embody the judgment of value it professes to embody. The direct frontal attack. Why? Why does it do so? What good does it do? Who said so? Is never permissible not because it is harsh or offensive, but because no values at all can justify themselves on that level. If you persist in that kind of trial, you will destroy all values, and so destroy the basis of your own criticism as well as the thing criticized. You must not hold a pistol to the head of the Tao, nor must we postpone obedience to the precepts until the credentials have been examined. Only those who are practicing the Tao will understand it, it is the well-nurtured man, and he alone, who can recognize reason when it comes. It is Paul, the Pharisee, the man, perfect as touching the law, who learns where and how the law was deficient. In order to avoid misunderstanding, I may add, though I myself am a theist, and indeed a Christian, I am not here attempting any indirect argument for theism. I am simply arguing that if we are to have values at all, we must accept the ultimate platitudes of practical reason as having absolute validity. That any attempt, having become skeptical about these, to reintroduce value lower down on some supposedly more realistic basis is doomed. Whether this position implies a supernatural origin from the Tao is a question I am not here concerned with. Yet how can the modern mind be expected to embrace the conclusion we have reached? This Tao, which it seems must be treated as an absolute, is simply a phenomenon like any other, the reflection upon the minds of our ancestors and the agricultural rhythm in which they lived or even in their psychology. 
we know already in principle how such things are produced. Soon we, sh soon we shall know in detail. Eventually, we shall be able to produce them at will. Of course, while we do not know how minds were made, we accept this mental furniture as a datum, even as a master. But many things in nature which were once our masters have become our servants. Why not this? Why must our conquest of nature stop short in stupid reverence before this final and toughest bit of nature which has hitherto been called the consciousness of man? You threaten us with some obscure disaster if we step outside it, but we have been threatened in that way by obscuritanists at every step in our advance, and each time the threat has proved false. You say we shall have no value at all if we step outside the Tao. Very well. We shall probably find that we can get on quite comfortably without them. Let us regard all ideas of what we ought to do simply as an interesting psychological survival. Let us step right out of all of that and start doing what we like. Let us decide for ourselves what man is to be and make him into that, not on any ground of imagined value, but because we want him to be such. Having mastered our own environment, let us now master ourselves and choose our destiny. This is a very possible position, and those who hold it cannot be accused of self-contradiction like the half-hearted skeptics who still hope to find real values when they have debunked the traditional ones. This is the rejection of the concept of value altogether. I shall need another lecture to consider it. Chapter 3. The Abolition of Man It came burning hot into my mind, whatever he said and however he flattered. When he got me home to his house, he would sell me for a slave. John Bunyan Man's conquest of nature is an expression often used to describe the progress of applied science. Man has nature whacked, said someone to a friend of mine not long ago. In their context, the words had a certain tragic beauty, for the speaker was dying of tuberculosis. No matter, he said, I know I am one of the casualties. Of course, there are casualties on the winning as well as the losing side, but that doesn't alter the fact that it is winning. I have chosen the story as my point of departure in order to make it clear that I do not wish to disparage all that is really beneficial in the process of described as man's conquest, much less all the real devotion and self-sacrifice that has gone to make it possible. But having done so, I must proceed to analyze this conception of a little more closely. In which sense is man the possessor of increasing power over nature? Let us consider three typical examples, the airplane, the wireless, and the contraceptive. In a civilized community, in peacetime, anyone who can pay for them may use these things. But it cannot strictly be said that when he does so, he is exercising his own proper or individual power over nature. If I pay you to carry me, I am not therefore myself a strong man. Any or all of the three things I have mentioned can be withheld from some men by other men, by those who sell, or those who allow the sale, or those who own the source of production, or those who make the goods. What we call man's power is, in reality, a power possessed by some men which they may or may not allow other men to profit by. Again, as regards the power manifested in the airplane or the wireless, Man is as much the patient or subject as the possessor, since he is the target for both bombs and for propaganda. And as regards to contraceptives, there is a paradoxical, negative sense in which all possible future generations are the patients or subjects of a power wielded by those already alive. By contraception, simply, they are denied existence. By contraception, used as a means of s selective breeding, they are, without their concurring voice, made to be what one generation, for its own reason, may choose to prefer. From this point of view, what we call man's power over nature turns out to be the power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. It is, of course, commonplace to complain that men have hitherto used badly and against their fellows the power that science has given them. But that is not the point I am trying to make. I am not speaking of particular corruptions and abuses which an increase of moral virtue would cure. I am considering what the thing called man's power over nature must always and essentially be. No doubt the picture could be modified by public ownership of raw materials and factories and public control of scientific research, but unless we have a world state, this will still mean the power of one nation over others. 
and even within the world state or the nation, it will mean, in principle, the power of majorities over minorities, and in the concrete, of a government over the people. And all long-term exercises of power, especially in breeding, must mean the power of earlier generations over later ones. The latter point is not always sufficiently emphasized, because those who write on social matters have not yet learned to imitate the physicist by always including time among the dimensions. In order to understand fully what man's power over nature, and therefore the power of some men over other men, really means, we must picture the race extended in time from date of its emergence to that of its extinction. Each generation exercises power over its successor, and each, insofar as it modifies the environment bequeathed to it and rebels against tradition, resists and limits the power of its predecessors. This modifies the picture, which is sometimes painted of a progressive emancipation from tradition and progressive control of nature, natural processes resulting in a continual increase of human power. In reality, of course, if any one age really attains by eugenics and scientific education the power to make its descendants what it pleases, all men who live after it are the patients of that power. They are weaker, not stronger. For though we may have put wonderful machines in their hands, we have preordained how they are to use them. And if, as is almost certain, the age which has thus attained maximum power over posterity were also the age emancipated from tradition, it would be engaged in reducing the power of its predecessors almost as drastically as that of its successors. And we must also remember that, quite apart from this, the later of the generation comes, the nearer it lives to that date of which the species becomes extinct, the less power it will have in the forward direction because its subjects will be so few. There is therefore no question of a power vested in the race of a whole steadily growing as long as the race survives. The last men, far from being the heirs of power, will be of all men most subjects to the dead hand of the great planners of the conditioners and will themselves exercise least power upon the future. The real picture is that of one dominant age, let it suppose the hundredth century AD, which resists all previous ages most successfully and dominates all subsequent ages most irresistibly, and thus is the real master of the human species. But then within this master generation, itself an infinitesimal minority of the species, the power will be exercised by the minority smaller still. The man's conquest of nature, if the dreams of some scientific planners are realized, means the rule of a few hundred of men over billions upon billions of men. There neither is, nor can there be, any simple increase of power on man's side. Each new power, won by man, is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he is also the prisoner who follows the triumphant car. I am not yet considering whether the total result of such ambivalent victories is a good thing or a bad. I am only making clear what man's conquest of nature really means and especially the final stage of that conquest, which perhaps is not far off. The final stage is come when man, by eugenics, by prenatal conditioning, and by an education and propaganda based on a perfect applied psychology, has obtained full control over himself. Human nature will be at the last part of nature to surrender to man. The battle will still be won. We shall have taken the thread of life out of the hands of the clotho, and be henceforth free to make our species whatever we wish to be. The battle will indeed be won, but who precisely will have won it? For the power of man to make himself what he pleases means, as we have seen, the power of some men to make others what we want. In all ages, no doubt, nurture and instruction have in some sense attempted to exercise this power. But the situation to which we must look forward will be novel in two respects. In the first place, the power will be enormously increased. Hitherto, the plans of educationalists have achieved very little of what they attempt and indeed, when we read them, how Plato would have every infant a bastard nursed in a bureau. Eliot would have had the boy see no men before the age of seven, and after no women, and how Locke wants children to have leaky shoes and no turn for poetry. We may well thank the beneficent obstinacy of real mothers, real nurses, and above all, real children for preserving the human race in such sanity as it still possesses. But the man-molders of the new age will be armed with the powers of an omnicompetent state of an irreversible scientific technique. 
we shall get at last a race of conditioners who really can cut out all posterity in what shape they please. The second difference is even more important. The older systems, both the kind of man the teacher wishes to produce and their motives for producing them, were prescribed by the Tao, a norm to which the teachers themselves were subject and from which they claimed no liberty to depart. They did not cut men to some pattern they had chosen. They handed on what they had received. They initiated the young neophyte into the mystery of humanity which overarched him and them alike. It was but old birds teaching young birds to fly. This will be changed. Values are now mere natural phenomenon. Judgments of value are to be produced in the pupil as part of the conditioning. Whatever tau there is will be the product, not the motive of education. The conditioners have been emancipated from all that. It is one more part of nature which they have conquered. The ultimate springs of human action are no longer for them something given. They have surrendered like electricity. It is the function of the conditioner to control, not to obey them. They know how to produce conscience and decide what kind of conscience they will produce. They themselves are outside and above. For we are assuming the last stage of man's struggle with nature. The final victory has been won. Human nature has been conquered, and of course, has conquered, in whatever sense those words may now bear. The conditioners, then, are to choose what kind of artificial tau they will, for their own good reasoning produce in the human race. They are the motivators, the creators of motives. But how are they going to motivate themselves? For a time, perhaps, by survival within their own minds of the old natural tau, Thus, at first, they may look upon themselves as servants and guardians of humanity and conceive that they have a duty to do it good. But it is only by confusion that they can remain in this state. They recognize the concept of duty as the result of certain processes which they can now control. Their victory has consisted precisely in emerging from the state in which they were acted upon by those processes to the state in which they use them as tools. One of the things they now have to decide is whether they will or will not so condition the rest of us that we can go on having the old idea of duty and the old reaction to it. How can duty help them to decide that duty itself is up for trial? It cannot also be judge. And good fares no better. They know quite well how to produce a dozen different conceptions of good in us. The question is which, if any, they should produce. No conception of good can help them to decide. It is absurd to fix on one of the things they are comparing and make it the standard of comparison. To some, it will appear that I am inventing a factitious difficulty for my conditioners. Other, more simple-minded critics may ask, why should you suppose that there will be such bad men? But I am not supposing them to be bad men. They are rather not men, in the old sense at all. They are, if you like, Men who have sacrificed their own share in traditional humanity in order to devote themselves to the task of deciding what humanity shall henceforth mean. Good and bad, applied to them, are words without content. For it is from them that the content of these words is henceforth to be derived. Nor is their difficulty factitious. We might suppose that it was possible to say, after all, most of us want more or less the same things. Food and drink and sexual intercourse, amusement, art, science, and the longest possible life for an individual and for the species? Let them simply say, this is what we happen to like, and let them condition men in the way most likely to produce it. Where's the trouble? In the first place, it is false that we all really like the same things. But even if we did, what motives to impel the conditioner to scorn delights and live laborious days in order that we, and posterity, may have what we like, their duty? But that is only the Tao, which they may decide to impose on us, but which cannot be valid for them. If they accept it, they are no longer makers of conscience, but still subjects, and their final conquest over nature has not really happened. What about the preservation of species? But why should the species be preserved? One of the questions before them is whether this feeling for posterity, they know well how it is produced, shall be continued or not. However far they go back or down, they can find no ground to stand on. Every motive they try to act on becomes, at once, a petito. It is not that they are bad men, they are not men at all. Stepping outside the Tao, they have stepped into the void. Nor are their subjects necessarily unhappy men, they are not men at all. 
They are artifacts. Man's final conquest has to be proved to be the abolition of man. Yet the conditioner will act. When I said just now that all motives fail them, I should have said all motives except one. All motives that claim any validity other than that of their felt emotional weight at a given moment have failed them. Everything except the sick volo, sick jubio, has been explained away. But what never claimed objectivity cannot be destroyed by subjectivism. The impulse to scratch when I itch or to pull to pieces when I am inquisitive is immune from the solvent which is fatal to my justice or honor or care for posterity. When all that says it is good has been debunked, what says I want remains. It cannot be exploded or seen through because it never had any pretensions. The conditioner, therefore, must come to be motivated simply by their own pleasure. I am not here speaking of the corrupting influence of power, nor expressing the fear that under its conditioner will degenerate. The very words corrupt and degenerate imply a doctrine of value and are therefore meaningless in this context. My point is that those who stand outside of all judgments of value cannot have any ground for preferring one of their own impulses to another except the emotional strength of that impulse. We may legitimately hope that among the impulses which arise in the minds thus emptied of all rational and spiritual motives, some will be benevolent. I am very doubtful myself whether the benevolent impulses stripped of the preference and the encouragement which the Tao teaches us to give them and left in the merely natural strength and frequency of psychological events will have much influence. I am very doubtful whether history shows us an example of a man who, having stepped outside of traditional morality and attained power, has used the power benevolently. I am inclined to think that the conditioner will hate the conditioned, though regarding as an illusion the artificial conscience, which they produced in us their subjects, they will yet perceive that it creates in an illusion of meaning for our lives which compares favorably with the futility of their own, and they will envy us as eunuchs envy men. But I do not insist on this, for it is mere conjecture. What is not conjecture is that our hope, even of conditioned happiness, rests on what is ordinarily called chance. The chance that benevolent impulses may on the whole predominate in our conditioner. For without the judgment, benevolence is good. That is, without re-entering the Tao, they can have no ground for promoting or stabilizing these impulses rather than any others. By the logic of their position, they must just take their impulses as they come, from chance. And chance here means nature. It is from hereditary digestion, the weather, and the association of ideas that the motives of the conditioner will spring. Their extreme rationalism, by seeing through all rationale, motives, leaves them creatures of wholly irrational behavior. If you will not obey the Tao, or else commit suicide, obedience to the impulse, and therefore in the long run to the mere nature, is the only course left open. At the moment, then, of man's victory over nature, we find the whole human race subjected to some individual men, and those individuals subjected to that in themselves which is purely natural, to their irrational impulses. Nature, untrammeled by values, rules the conditioners, and through them, all humanity. Man's conquest and nature turns out in the moment of its consummation to be nature's conquest of man. Every victory we seem to win has led us step by step to this conclusion. All nature's apparent reverses have been but tactical withdrawals. We thought we were beating her back when she was luring us on. What looked to us like hands held up in surrender was really the opening of arms to enfold us forever. If the fully planned and conditioned world, with its Tao, a mere product of the planning, comes into existence, nature will be troubled no more by the rest of species that rose in revolt against her so many million years ago, will be vexed no longer by its chatter of truth and mercy and beauty and happiness, and if the eugenics are efficient enough, there will be no second revolt but all snug beneath the conditioners and the conditioners beneath her, till the moon falls or the sun grows cold. My point may be clearer to some if it's put in a different form. Nature is a word of varying meanings, which can be best understood if we consider its various opposites. The natural is the opposite of the artificial, the civil and the human, the spiritual, the supernatural. The artificial does not now concern us. If we take the rest of the list of opposites, however, I think we can get a rough idea of what men have meant by nature and what it is they oppose to her. 
as distinct from what is less fully so or not so at all. She seems to be the world of quantity as against the world of quality, of objects as against consciousness, of the bound as against the wholly partially autonomous, of that which knows no value as against that which both has and perceives value, of efficient causes, or in some modern systems, of no causality at all, as against final causes. Now I can take it that when we understand a thing analytically, and then dominate and use it for our own convenience, we reduce it to the level of nature, in the sense that we suspend our judgment of value about it, ignore its final cause, if any, and treat it in terms of quantity. This repression of elements in what would otherwise be our total reaction to it is sometimes very noticeable and even painful. Something has to be overcome before we can cut up a dead man or a live animal in a dissecting room. These objects resist the movement of the mind whereby we thrust them into the world of mere nature. But in other instances, too, a similar price is exacted for our analytical knowledge and manipulative power, even if we have ceased to count it. We do not look at trees either as dryads or as beautiful objects while we cut them into beams. The first man who did so may have felt the price keenly, and the bleeding trees in Virgil and Spencer may be far-off echoes of that primal sense of impiety. The stars lost their dignity as astronomy developed, and the dying god has no place in chemical agriculture. To many, no doubt, this process is simply the gradual discovery that the real world is different from what we expected, and the old opposition to Galileo or the body snatchers is simply obscure. But that is not the whole story. It is not the greatest of modern scientists who feel most sure that the object stripped of its qualitative properties and reduced to mere quantity is wholly real. Little scientists and little unscientific followers of science may think so. The great minds know very well that the object, so treated, is an artificial abstraction that, sometime, that something of its reality has been lost. From this point of view, the conquest of nature appears in a new light. We reduce things to mere nature in order that we may conquer them. We are always conquering nature because nature is the name for what we have, to some extent, conquered. The price of conquest is to treat a thing as mere nature. Every conquest over nature increases her domain. The stars do not become nature till we can weigh and measure them. The soul does not become nature till we can psychoanalyze her. The resting of powers from nature is also the surrendering of things to nature. As long as the process stops short of the final stage, we may well hold that the gain outweighs the loss. But as soon as we take the final step of reducing our own species to the level of mere nature, the whole process is stultified for the time, for this time, the being who stood to gain and the being who has been sacrificed are one and the same. This is one of the many instances where the carry this is one of the many instances where to carry a principle to what seems its logical conclusion produces absurdity. It is like the famous Irishman who found that a certain kind of stove reduced his fuel bill by half and thence concluded that two stoves of the same kind would enable him to warm his house with no fuel at all. It is the magician's bargain. Give up our soul, get power in return. But once our soul, that is, ourselves, has been given up, the power thus conferred will not belong to us. We shall in fact be the slaves and puppets of that to which we have given our souls. It is in the man's power to treat himself as a mere natural object, and his own judgments of value as raw material for scientific manipulation to alter at will. The objection to his doing so does not lie in the fact that this point of view like one's first day in a dissecting room, is painful and shocking till we grow used to it. The pain and the shock are at most a warning and a symptom. The real objection is that if man chooses to treat himself as raw material, raw material he will be, not raw material to be manipulated, as he fondly imagined by himself, but mere appetite, that is, mere nature, and the person of his dehumanized conditioner. We have been trying, like Lear, to have it both ways, to lay down our human prerogatives, and yet at the same time to retain it. It is impossible. Either we are rational spirit obliged forever to obey the absolute values of the Tao, or else we are mere nature to be kneaded and cut into new shapes for the pleasure of masters who must, by hypothesis, have no motive but their own natural impulses.
Only the Tao provides a common human law of action which can overarch rulers and ruled alike. A dogmatic belief in the objective values is necessary to the very idea of a rule which is not tyranny, or an obedience which is not slavery. I am not here thinking solely, perhaps not even chiefly, of those who are our public enemies at the moment. The process, which if not checked, will abolish man, goes on apace among communists and democrats, no less among fascists. The method may at first differ in brutality, but many a mild-eyed scientist in Princess many a populist dramatists, many an amateur philosopher in our midst, means in the long run just the same as the Nazi rulers of Germany, traditional values are to be debunked and mankind to be cut into some fresh shape at the will which must by hypothesis be an arbitrary will of some few lucky people in one lucky generation which has learned how to do it. The belief that we can invent ideologies at pleasure and the consequent treatment of mankind as merely specimens preparations begin to affect our very language. Once we killed bad men, now we liquidate unsocial elements. Virtue has become interrogations and diligence dynamism. And boys likely to be worthy of commission are potential officer material. Most wonderful of all, the virtues of thrift and temperance and even of ordinary intelligence are sales resistance. The true significance of what is going on has been concealed by the use of the abstraction man. Not that the word man is necessarily a pure abstraction in the Tao itself, as long as we remain within it. We find the concrete reality in which to participate to be truly human, the real common will and common reason of humanity, alive and growing like a tree and branching out as the situation varies into ever new beauties and dignities of application. While we speak from within the Tao, we can speak of man having power over himself in a sense truly analogous to an individual's self-control. But the moment we step outside the regard of the Tao as, as a mere subjective product, this possibility has disappeared. What is now common to all men is a mere abstract universal and HCF and man's conquest of himself means simply the rule of the conditioner over the conditioned human material. The world of post-humanity, which some knowingly and some unknowingly, nearly all men in all nations are at present laboring to produce. Nothing I can say will prevent some people from describing this lecture as an attack on science. I deny the charge, of course, and real natural philosophers, there are some now alive, will perceive that in defending value I defend inter alia the value of knowledge, which must die like every other when its roots in the Tao are cut. But I can go further than that. I even suggest that from science herself the cure might come. I have described as a magician's bargain that process whereby man surrenders object after object and finally himself to nature in return for power, and I meant what I said. The fact that the scientist has succeeded where the magician failed has put such a wide contrast between them in popular thought than the real story of birth of science is misunderstood. You will even find people who write about the 16th century as if magic were a medieval survival and science, the new thing that came in to sweep it away. Those who have studied the period know better. There was very little magic in the Middle Ages. The 16th century and 17th century are the high noon of magic. The serious magical endeavor and the serious scientific endeavor are twins. One was sickly and died and the other strong and throve. But they were twins. They were born of the same impulse. I allow that same, certainly not all, of the early scientists were actually by a pure love of knowledge. But if we consider the temper of the age as a whole, we can discern the impulse of which I speak. There is something which unites magic and applied science while separating both from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality and the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. For magic and applied science alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of man. The solution is a technique, and both in the practice of this technique are ready to do the thing hitherto regarded as disgusting and impious, such as digging up and mutilating the dead. If we compare the chief trumpeter of the new era, Bacon, with Marlowe's Faustus, the similarity is striking. You will read in some critics that Faustus has a thirst for knowledge. In reality, he hardly mentions it. It is not truth he wants from the devils, 
but gold and guns and girls. All things that move between the quiet poles shall be at his command, and a sound magician is mighty God. In the same spirit, Bacon condemns those who value knowledge as an end in itself. This for him is to use a mistress for a pleasure what ought to be a spouse for fruit. The true object is to extend man's power to the performance of all things possible. He rejects magics because it doesn't work, but his goal is that of the magician. In Periclesis, the character of magician and scientist are combined. No doubt those who really founded modern science were usually those whose love of truth exceeded their love of power. In every mixed movement, the efficacy comes from the good elements, not from the bad. But the presence of the bad elements is not irrelevant to the direction the efficacy takes. It might be going too far to say that the modern scientific movement was tainted from its birth, but I think it would be true to say that it was born in an unhealthy neighborhood and at an inespacious hour. Its triumphs may have been too rapid and purchased at too high a price. Reconsideration and something like repentance may be required. It is then possible to imagine a new natural philosophy, continually conscious that the nature object produced by analysis and abstraction is not reality, but only a view, and always correcting the abstraction. I hardly know what I am asking for. I hear rumors that, that Goth's approach to nature deserves fuller consideration, that even Steiner may have seen something that orthodox researchers have missed. The regenerate science, which I have in my mind, would not do even to minerals and vegetables what modern science threatens to do to man himself. When it explained, it would not explain away. When it spoke of the parts, it would remember the whole. While studying the it, it would not lose the Martin Bubber calls the Vouse situation. The analogy between the Tao of man and the instinctive of animal species would mean for it new light cast on unknown things. Instinct by the only known reality of consciousness and not a reduction of consciousness to the category of instinct, its followers would not be free with the words of only and merely. In a word, it would conquer nature, without being at the same time conquered by her, and by knowledge at a lower cost than that of life. Perhaps I am asking impossibilities. Perhaps, in the nature of things, analytical understanding must always be a basilisk which kills what it sees and only sees by killing. But if the scientists themselves cannot arrest the process before it reaches the common reason and kills that too, then someone else must arrest it. What I most fear is the reply that I am only one more obscurantist, that this barrier, like all previous barriers set up against the advance of science, can be safely passed. Such a reply springs from the fatal serialism of the modern imagination, the image of infinite, unlinear progression, which so haunts our minds, because we have to use numbers, so we tend to think of every process as if it must be like the numeral series, where every step to all eternity is the same kind of step as the one before. I implore you to remember the Irishman and his two stoves. There are progressions in which the last step is incommensurable with the others, and in which to go the whole way is to undo all labor of your previous journey. To reduce the Tao to a mere natural product is a step of that kind. Up to that point, the kind of explanation which explains things away may give us something through at a heavy cost. Up to that point, the kind of explanation which explains things away may give us something, though at a heavy cost. But you cannot go on explaining away forever. You will find that you have explained explanation itself away. You cannot go on seeing through things forever. The whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it. It is good that the window should be transparent because the street or garden beyond is opaque. How if you saw through the garden too? It is no use trying to see through first principles if you see through everything. Then everything is transparent. But a wholly transparent world is an invisible world. To see through all things is the same as not to see.